um, if we look at the opening slide, the cover slide, there, there are a couple of things that, that struck me when I, when I first saw the title. One was the humility shown by the question mark behind Hong Kong as a regional green finance hub. <laughs> and secondly, I'm very grateful uh, that the organizers have actually broadened the subject beyond just green to incorporate ESG. And um, if we look at recent uh, publications, and this is almost hot off the press. This is a US green, uh, no, UK's Green Finance Task Force report. This was just published in March this year. And it came with 10 recommendations. And the sixth recommendation actually is on clarifying the role of the investor and their responsibilities. And I'll just repeat some of the key ones there. And it says that re relevant regulators should ensure fiduciary duty clearly states the importance of ESG issues. Because it's still a subject of debate in certain quarters as to whether ESG, uh, fiduciary duty, should incorporate ESG. And I think that as regulators uh, make that clear, the whole industry can function with a more clear foundation as to what fiduciary duty should or should not incorporate. That's one. Secondly, is that uh, the government should require that the statement of investment principles, i.e. the asset owners, <laughs> um, should also include statements to the extent that social, ethical, environmental issues are being considered in their investments. And asset owners are actually a very critical element to the ecosystem. Because I, I still recall in, um, in one of my uh, interviews with the CEO of a large corporation who makes great products, and he says, we make great products not because we have great engineers or designers. We make great products because we have demanding clients. So when institutional uh, owners and asset owners demand that ESG is incorporated in the investment decision process, the whole value chain will follow from that. And third is that, um, that even in the retail space for investment funds, investment funds should also clearly demonstrate what is the ESG impact of the funds. Now that's March 2018. Um, now the, uh, the French actually came out even before the Paris Climate Agreement in uh, the mid of 2015 with Article 173 of the French Energy Transition Law. And it, it also talks about incorporating ESG, but one of the uh, elements that is included is that in, its invest, in the institutional investors' investment policy, they should also align it with the national strategy for energy and ecological transition. So how is the investments positively contributing to a two-degree world? And hence, when you have demands like this, it's not surprising that a service provider, an asset manager like us, uh, now have in our sustainable and responsible investment funds reporting that talks about per 10 million investment, what is the carbon dioxide emissions that's been avoided? Water that's been treated, uh, renewable energy generated, or materials or waste that has been covered? The uh, part of the debate on whether ESG should, is part or should and be part of one's fiduciary duty is this debate that doing good must come at the expense of doing well. And uh, increasingly, there are more and more academic research that has come out, and I'm quoting one of them, and we'll hear more from Professor Benz later on. And this is a study that Oxford University has done on 200 academic studies. And what it demonstrates is that um, the, it looks at the relationship between sustainability practices 
and certain other outcomes. And it shows that in 90% of the cases, sound sustainability leads to lower cost of capital, an 88% uh, improvement in operational performance, or uh, companies that practices good ESG actually, on 88% of their time, have better operational performance. And in 80% of the case, that not surprisingly leads to better stock price performance. Now, I think it's also fair to say that these, this has been evaluated in a longer time frame. So other than incorporating ESG, is this drive towards avoiding short-termism, that societies and investors should in fact evaluate investment performance over a longer term time horizon. Now, if we look at the, um, the sustainable assets worldwide, and this is something that's uh, a bit dated. It's published in 2016 in the Global Sustainable Investment Review, but it gives you a sense of the scale. Europe is in the lead with $12 trillion uh, in uh, sustainable assets, followed by the US. And Asia is actually at a very early stage of its development. And so globally, more than a quarter of the assets managed are uh, managed in a, a sustainable way versus 0.8% in, uh, in Asia. But as we have heard earlier on, uh, the growth in Asia is going to be quite massive. And uh, as Joseph has mentioned, uh, in 2018, uh, Moody's uh, predicts a further 60% increase in global issuance. China is in the forefront of, uh, of the green bond market, so we are very fortunate in Hong Kong to be sitting at the doorstep of what is one of the largest green bond markets, actually, and, and indeed, we should fully capitalize on this. And, uh, and the, the sources are deployed, in case we, we're just thinking of renewable energy across low carbon buildings, transport, water, waste, um, land use and forestry. The, um, and there's now even talk about the, uh, the belt and road and how that can be even made more green. Now, um, the, uh, uh, Joseph has covered a number of these points, but the ones I want to add is that um, having the asset owners and fund managers uh, integrate ESG gives relevance to the work that corporates listed companies in Hong Kong now need to do in terms of publish, uh, publishing their ESG efforts. And that has now been uh, made, uh, has been upgraded by the Hong Kong EX to a comply and explain basis. The, um, the UN supported or backed principles for responsible investment. Uh, we now have 23 signatories from Hong Kong uh, I think we could do with a bit more asset owners sign up for it. Um, and one, one thing that's not mentioned here is that we talk about the Paris Climate Agreement, and, uh, which contains national targets. And Hong Kong is part and parcel of that. So the Hong Kong Environmental Agency or Bureau actually do have targets for quite substantial cuts from 2005 to 2030. And that's not going to come about unless society as a whole contributes to that. Lastly, uh, we hear about green bonds. I just want to make the point, as I do with uh, green, we have to think beyond green into ESG. And green is finance is more than just about green bonds. Now, this, this is not an... Uh, an advertisement as such, and I, I know there's people from the SFC in the audience, but I, I just want to give a sense that um, the, uh, the Green Bond Fund that, that we do manage is one of the many products that's in the socially responsible space. And, and so, so we do need to broaden our horizon when we think of green in terms of what that means in what we can do in the finance space. And in Hong Kong, water has actually been the, the, the element that has captured the investor's imagination. So with that, um, I think time's up. 
So uh, happy to accede to the next uh, speaker. Thank you.